today on CityCast Madison. Here's what Madison's talking about. Debates about housing, preserving historic buildings, and zoning rules have been front and center in city politics lately, even by Madison standards. That's pitting people who love their residential neighborhoods against people who want the city to get serious about Madison's very real housing crisis. The whole team's here, Bianca Martin, Molly Stentz, and I, we get into it. We also talk about plans for Lake Monona's waterfront, why Madison's police reforms are taking forever, and public art that looks like private parts. It's Friday, February 3rd. I'm producer Dylan Brogan, and this is CityCast Madison. I want to talk about, just to kick us off, like probably the sexiest, most fun topic that everyone loves talking about, and that's zoning. It's having a real moment. In particular, on Sherman Avenue, right, this building right by Tenney Park in the Yahara River, it's on the 1600 block. It's right across the street from Tenney Park, right by the boat launch. That has brought up all these issues about zoning and historical preservation and I've lived in that neighborhood my whole life, and I had no idea that the building that might be demolished for a five-building housing development um, is historic. So this has prompted a lot of debate. Have you guys heard about this? I feel like if we did it, we should do like a person on the street and ask people, so the filing, the filing building, you know that one, right? No, absolutely no one. It's not right on Sherman Ave, you know, if you're driving to the north side or to Maple Bluff or whatever. Uh, but when I, w- I always thought of it as the WPS building, which is like an insurance company. But it hasn't been that in like 25 years. Sonic Foundry was in there. There's this big parking lot in the back. And I learned how to, my, that's where my mom and dad taught me how to drive uh, when I was 16. And well, how I learned stick in my 30s, like just like a year ago. So clearly, that's why it's historic. I have not heard of the filing house <laughs> as a historic treasure. After I've that. never heard it called that either, but apparently it does have historical significance. It was built in 1950 for the Credit Union National Association as their like world headquarters, CUNA, you might have heard of. They haven't been there since 1979, but President Harry Truman, Harry S. Truman, he gave a speech there, and this building was on the cover of the New York Times, and he, gave, he talked about how credit unions um, are all about cooperative ideas, and this is uh, a vision for American foreign policy right after World War II, and there's a cornerstone dedicated for him. So that's what historical preservationists are saying, why, this, why they shouldn't knock this building down, and it hits at the nerve that is this housing debate um, that is having a real moment, and the tide seems to be turning in how we talk about these things. But I think the key with this is like you mentioned, it's this kind of small building. It's not that unique. It's not that interesting. And it's set way back from the road. So people don't notice it because there's that huge parking lot. You would drive by it a million times and it's just kind of nondescript and you'd never think about it. And it's not really open to the public. It's not a public gathering space and it's not iconic or immediately recognizable. I do take their point, the resident, that just because something isn't beautiful, that doesn't mean it's not historical. But I would want to hear, I guess, a little bit more um, persuasive, I guess, about why this history really warrants keeping. Madison used to tip more towards what neighbors want. And now the housing issue has gotten to such a point where we need it so badly that a lot of people are more pro-development than in the past. Do you guys get that sense? I think neighbors might fight you on that characterization because I think the struggle and tensions around development have been long, <laughs> yeah. probably date back to the city's founding. <laughs> but I think you're right in that what's unique about Madison compared to a lot of other cities and big cities I've lived in is that citizens did have somewhat of a voice in that there were city committees that could exercise power. I mean, now, granted, people will tell you they had to fight tooth and nail to get any changes made in a development because usually a developer, you know, applies to build something, maybe knock something down in the process, neighborhood gets word of it, figures out there's something that wasn't considered that their needs weren't considered, whether it's traffic patterns, whether it's setbacks, you know, if it's too big, whether there's trees that will be removed, any number of things that could affect their quality of life in the neighborhood. And then they have to stand up and fight it in order to make change. But I think you're right in that 
sometimes they were successful in making these developments better. Um, but through a long drawn out process that developers hated and the whole city was a little bit mocked for, right? This like, do we have to design everything by committee over here? I think most people can see the benefit of it. And there are similar housing buildings like Wood Sherman Terrace around there. And I actually think it fits in really nicely. But you should hear my dad talk about it, who like, he is so against this just on principle. And I don't think his motives are bad. But you know, your neighborhood change in if you live there, that's tough. It'd Tell rough. you why on principle? Like what what's getting him? Because I I have like some thoughts on yeah. this. And I feel like I'm, I'm curious what's getting him on this. traffic. It's the he doesn't want it, all this traffic going down Sherman Avenue. 330 units, that could be like 600 more people driving down the block. And he doesn't want to see a lot of traffic. Bus rapid transit and public transit will help with that. But yeah, he's right. There probably will be more traffic, right? Mm -hmm. Well, people were getting more folks moving to Madison. So we have to recognize that reality that that's just real. I, I don't know if I think I saw a figure of like 100,000 more people in the next by 2050. My reaction is thinking... Okay, I keep hearing about the need for affordable housing, and I have this sort of suspicion sometimes, like, well, how much of the housing that's being built is actually affordable? Here's the thing, like, the way you get affordable housing is you have more houses than you have people. And right now we have more people than we have houses. There are certain areas that you should preserve the character of the character of like I would want like the Atwood neighborhood like there's something special about sort of the old feel and the characteristics but some of those arguments I guess for like a neighborhood that is just you know single family households and they're like they want it to stay the same and they don't want duplexes going up next to them I don't know I, I'm less sympathetic <laughs> all right well I'm gonna tie this all up because we've had a, a fun little discussion about it basically the historical preservation of the filing house, that's going to be considered. Uh, it may not stop it from being demolished because of other zoning changes that are happening. Uh, there's a great debate, dueling editorials in the Isthmus, um, one from Mayor Dave, who was just talking about how historical preservationists are using this to stop development. And another person who submitted the historical nomination who's saying, hey, there's not that many historical nominations, and this is an important site. So I think those are two good reads, and there is a vote coming up. Um, there, there, nothing's been decided, so we'll see in the next few months whether this building will be knocked down, whether this housing project on Sherman Avenue near Tenney Park is going to it's going to happen. It still needs approval. And yeah, it's something we'll keep an eye on, right? Indeed. You guys can say yes. <laughs> and, uh, Please clap. Yeah, clap. <laughs> and hey, uh, we got so much more to talk about, but Bianca's already thinking about the weekend. Hey, it's Friday. If you have friends coming over, have a dinner party planned, or just feel like getting fancy this weekend, let me tell you about one of my favorite places, Cork and Bottle. It's the locally owned liquor store on East Johnson near the corner of Johnson and Patterson. And it's by far my favorite go-to spot. I love finding new things there. Like I just picked up an Icelandic vodka and a tasty herbaceous gin from a local distillery. They've got pretty wines from around the world, funky local beers, and top shelf agave selections for us tequila fans in the house. If it's unique or obscure, they're probably into it. And honestly, they feel like family to me at this point. Shout out to Gregory, you keep me coming back. And I found out that you can bring your dog. So now all I need is a dog. Cheers. And so speaking of development, what is going on downtown on, along the waterfront? Well, I'm glad that you mentioned it, Molly, because it is the news of the week that I am very excited about, which is a reimagining of the Lake Monona Terrace. By that, I mean a challenge. There has been a competition to improve the waterfront and our green spaces around the waterfront. And there are some... They have three finalists and they are ambitious proposals to hopefully make the terrace a must see destination. Cost estimates around like 150 to 250 million dollars. Whoa. Um yeah. Bank money. Like the whole part of the whole lakefront around Monona Terrace really. Like when you're driving in on John yep. Nolan all the way to Willie Street. Yep, exactly. Uh 1.7 miles of shoreline, 17 acres of waterfront to the hairball. 
that like intersection we all love to hate at John Nolan at Willie that they literally just spent so many months digging up and tearing apart and redoing like that's the part we're talking about right yeah. a law park all the way up to that intersection well and then another one like um by Olin Park there's some very exciting things happening um and I I don't know I'm I'm just really jazzed to see the presentations basically uh the city selected three design firms they offered their master plans what are your favorite parts of some of these proposals because that they really are cool it's like a total transformation of the lake yeah not only did the the finalists just present the plans but our public comment period has begun like we get to weigh in so now is the time to go check these out we have eight weeks of public review for the three proposals and that'll close march 23rd so i can request a ferris wheel Where's the Ferris wheel? How is that not part of this? <laughs> oh my God, Molly, I literally just got shivers of excitement. $150 million Ferris wheel. Obviously, Molly's brilliant. She should have been a part of the, this planning. Um, no Ferris wheel, but there are really, really neat things uh, that are being offered up here. Um, so the three different proposals, there's one um, is going to feature like a big sloping park over John Nolan that I think what stands out about this one is like it has this big dramatic pier with a boathouse and but it like the pier kind of extends up through King Street. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I'm sorry. I'm trying to visualize this King Street like hits Wilson and then they build a pier that goes into the lake that goes over John Nolan. Yes. And so it would kind of make open up this big opportunity for, you know, foot traffic. They're trying to make the most of the waterfront and make it easier for folks from the Capitol Square to be able to access. Yes. Um, and this so one yes. of them has that sort of plan, which is cool. And the boathouse looks really cool, like they have a cool circular situation that's pretty beautiful. So that's one of the plans. Connecting it to the downtown because it is hard to yeah. get there from. It is Capitol. weird. Yeah, it's, it's hard weird to get that you got to like do that little zigzag to get to John Nolan from the Capitol. There's another one, Sazaki's Law Park Ledge. This one would also include like a park over John Nolan Drive, an amphitheater, a boathouse, community center, restaurant, an outdoor event space, and beach. And then there's third one is proposing a walk on water at Olin Park. This one's probably the one I'm most interested in. They're basically proposing a sort of walkway around Olin Park that has like this marshy space in the middle, a circular walkway. I think it's the most visually kind of impactful presentation that I, I've seen. I want to know, so like, is the city actually going to let us, is this like the snowplow naming contest where they are literally beholden to us? Well, oh, I think it's input and then, you know, we elected people, I guess, to move this forward. When is this happening, Bianca? It can't be that soon. Do they say? So all the plans are open for public comment. You can read about them. You can see them online. And also you can actually go in person and see the presentation boards on display at Madison Park's new office building over on East Lake Street, uh, Lakeside Street. The committee is going to put the plan forward to the Common Council um, some months down the line. I'm thinking late summer. So you mentioned the Parks Department. And all I could think of was something that people were snickering about on the internet this week, which is this sculpture that's been hanging up in the building. Have you heard about this? Well, I saw the picture on Reddit, and yes, from uh, it's a 3D sculpture made out of bamboo. But from one angle, it looks very, um, well... Phallic. Phallic. It looks very phallic. It's it's obvious. <laughs> we have a, a long history of this in Madison for some reason. Maybe all public art eventually gets scrutinized like this, like Nails Tales. They took it down. That People hated that for years, though. This one is, is just so random that like I, I thought, oh, they put up new public art. I was kind of excited. And then I was like, wait, no, this thing has been there for years. And I was like, wait, why are people just angry about it today? Well, it <laughs> was in an art gallery. It's a Japanese artist, and he was like commissioned to do it part of the Sister City program. It was part of an art exhibit in 2016 and then it was at Edgewood College and the city owns it though so then they built this new building for the Madison Parks Division so they finally moved it and apparently there's a an angle in which that maybe didn't exist before but yeah this art has been around for a while and this is the first I've heard of it it, it really it's a little unfortunate that angle though and you... it's meant to be viewed standing on the ground looking up at it right but then somebody took a picture looking at it from the side 
and put it on Reddit. And everybody's like, why do we have a big penis hanging up from the Parks Department office? I feel a little bad for the artists, but to be honest, it's art. It's public art, and it started conversation, and yes, it's juvenile, but I also don't think it's, like, the worst thing in the world that some public art is, like, getting buzz online. Uh, On a more serious note, something that's been on my mind this week in the wake of Tyree Nichols' death in Memphis and the police body cam and surveillance video being released. What's happening with our own efforts to monitor police here in Madison? Dylan and I reported on this years. I mean, it's been almost eight years since Tony Robinson was killed at the hands of the police. And we've had so many serious conversations about how how this needs to change, how there needs to be different result where police officers can go home at night and residents can go home at night, that people can be safe and can live together. And so, man, here we are almost eight years later, more events keep happening, right? Quadrant Wilson. I mean, we don't, so many. And we have this new civilian police oversight board and they've finally, maybe, hopefully, (laughs) have a monitor that will stick around but what what can he even do? Dylan, have you been following this? Yeah, well, this was the, you're right, it took years to come about, and they spent a lot of money on surveys and committees and everything, but the main, the main tool, that the new tool that was going to help solve this problem was this new police civilian oversight board and this new independent monitor position, sometimes called an independent auditor. That was the big recommendation, and so the first thing they did is set up this civilian oversight board, and their job was to hire this independent monitor. And this is this is supposed to be the big reform that Madison was making, right? So we have one. We have this guy, Hired right? In they, November, yeah. What's he doing? What does he have the power to do? The Police and Fire Commission are supposed to be the oversight body of, uh, or are, they are. They ha- Everything has to basically go through them. So this new board, this new office, this new independent monitor is supposed to have some investigative powers. A citizen or the the board says, hey, we want you to look into this incident. And so they do an independent investigation and then they basically present a report and recommendations. And then maybe then the police and fire commission can act because ultimately it has to go through them. But the idea is that the police shouldn't be the ones investigating themselves. The police and fire commission can do investigations, but it's a very cumbersome process that puts too much onus on the complainant. So this is supposed to be the check that gives the citizenry and the public a way to investigate police outside of the the channels that have existed. The first thing that comes to my mind is we need to talk to Robert. I'd like That's to talk to That's the independent auditor, him. right? Robert yeah, Copley? The, Robert Copley. Open invitation. We'd love to talk to you. We are obviously tired of the tragedies that we have to witness over and over and over again. It's demoralizing. You had this great point about body cameras. Yeah, I heard um, just, you know, from the Madison mayoral forum that just happened uh, that we need our police officers to be equipped with body cams. That was a discussion, something that came up. I was surprised. I didn't realize that our police officers didn't have them. I think a lot of people are. And so the the council has brought it up, voted it down. Do you think, Dylan, we're going to see that come back before the council? It's been recommended, and uh, it's we're Madison's unique in that uh, a lot of cities have chosen this to be their big reform, right? And, uh, and more and more police departments have these body cams. It's becoming very normal, and Madison has resisted it. It doesn't come from the police. It comes from people who want police reform because they just think it's throwing more money into this is just another tool for law enforcement, more money for the police. Madison has gone against the tide in terms of getting a police body cams, and I guess I just don't see that changing. There's research to that effect that what video, what body cam video shows is the point of view of the police officer, which many citizens are arguing we need a lot more than just that. Well, sorry to bring us down into yeah, this Molly. space of, but that's kind of my job here, guys. No, it's 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 super crucial. I'm. It's important that we talk about this, and I know it's on people's minds. Democracy is slow, and hard, and messy. And that's our new motto. It's not just meat sticks. 
and brilliance. Bianca Martin, Molly Stentz, thanks for joining me on our Friday News Roundup. And thanks for letting me try out this hosting chair. To see the plans for rebuilding the waterfront and read dueling editorials about historic buildings, check our show notes. And hey, if you got an idea for the show or something we should be talking about, hit us up. We're madison at citycast.fm or leave us a voicemail at 608-318-3367. And that's all for Friday here on CityCast Madison. We're produced by Molly Stentz and me, Dylan Brogan. Our host is Bianca Martin. Music is by Carl Christensen. If you enjoyed the show, why not tell somebody's dad about us? You can also get more news delivered right to your inbox from our friends at Madison Minutes. We'll be back Monday morning with more news from around the city. See you later. <laughs>